Investors Chronicle. Hello and welcome back to the IC Interviews. I'm Mary McDougall and today I'm delighted to be joined by Janice Henderson's James Henderson. James joined Henderson Global Investors as a trainee fund manager nearly four decades ago and has run many funds since, mainly focused on UK equities. He currently co-manages three investment trusts, Lowland Investment Company and the equity portfolio of Laudabenture, which are both categorised as UK equity income funds, as well as Henderson Opportunity Trust, another UK equity portfolio with more of a growth focus. He also co-manages Janice Henderson UK Equity Income and Growth Fund. Today, we're going to talk through how James approaches investing, some of the key differences between the trusts and what parts of the market he is currently most excited about. James, thank you for joining me. Thank you, Mary. Now, you must have your work cut out with that lot. It's a lot of, lot of funds we're managing. You're frequently cited as being a so-called value or contrarian fund manager. But looking across the holdings in your funds, it looks to me like you span everything in the UK, from growth to value right across the market cap spectrum. I wondered how you might describe your investment approach. Do, do you think in terms of value versus growth, or are you naturally opportunistic between the two? Yes, I, I am a value manager and contrarian by nature. But when I run the portfolio, diversity matters. So what we do is we have buckets, um, a bucket approach, whereby there is a bucket, for instance, of ESG-related investments. There's a bucket for long-term growth companies. There is there is a recovery bucket. We, we're always looking for full recovery situations. And and I, we always run, and I run the funds with Laura Foll. We, we are after diversification through the bucket approach, and we run relatively long lists of stocks. So it, that in that way, we do span the market. But by nature, it is contrarian. Um, we don't ever believe things are as good as you're told, and they're not always as bad as you're told either. And therefore, we're usually buying things when they're a bit out of favour and, and selling them when they're in, in favour. OK, so... Of, of your buckets, which buckets are you seeing the best value value in at the moment? Well, the the recovery element, the the after lockdown, um, there is there's real pent up demand coming through, and companies that have have been challenged for a number of years are now re- seeing a return of, of of growth, and at the same time, they've really got their costs um, down in in the in the, in the during the difficult period. Now they're seeing their top line sales growth going up. They're seeing their margins expand. And so companies that were challenged over in recent years, some of them are coming through with very good growth. Um, so that's, that area is where we've been dialing up that recovery element of the portfolio. Uh, at the same time, there are, there are new companies coming through in the UK, and that's exciting. Um, so it's it's broad the um what we're doing at the moment we're looking at at small medium and large companies um and the balance between them is has been altering a bit um we we reduced some of the medium and smaller companies to buy the la- some of the larger stocks um but on the whole um our turnover is is relatively low um and that that way, um, we we are taking a long term view on the companies we're buying. That's interesting. Could you give some examples of the names of, in the recovery area that you're that you've been buying? Yes, um, of the, of, in the large company company stocks, um, Marks and Spencers, for instance, has been. Um, hasn't been in the portfolio, um, any of the portfolios until last year. Um, and we've been buying it for, over the last year, building up the holding. Uh, another area is, is banks uh, in the big companies. Um, the banks, uh, I think the, over the last year, there's been a clarity and a focus coming out of the management of uh, the big UK banks that is leading be to think that um, they're on a recovery tack. They've taken provisions, very large provisions, and the size and provisions um, are probably larger than necessary. And we, and I think as a result, we will see earnings surprise on the upside from those banks. 
Yeah. Uh, I was having a look at your your fund performances, and you've had some some great performance. Henderson Opportunities Trust's share price is up over over a hundred percent over the past twelve months. How much? Sort of good news do you think is priced into the market at the moment? You said you're looking at this these recovery areas. How much how much do you think might have played out? I, I think this is, is relatively um early days in the, in, in the recovery of the UK economy. You have to remember the UK economy has has been battling with before COVID was adjusting to leaving the European community. And um, this has been a drag to businesses. Companies' capital spend had been held back even before COVID um, because of these uncertainties. And there is that, that, that it's happened now and we're moving forward. And that is seeing, um, that is, that is seeing a pickup in capital spend, is seeing a, a pickup in, in confidence. Um, from from in, from some companies, and that's leading to um, um, a better, more certain outlook, and that's leading to a, a re-rating of some of the shares. Um, in in the smaller company area, um, one of the features has been the alternative energy names, and they came right um, share price wise last year, and they may be discounting some of the good. That their strong prospects, you know, the share prices may be got too forward looking. So we've just been reducing that area a bit, to, and that's been financing some of the recovery type shares um, in the portfolio. Um, I think we were lucky last year in one respect in something like POT that two different areas, those um, early stage companies, the alternative energy companies, came. Share so so strong share prices at the same time as the, the latter part of the year. Some of the um, value recovery names had a good time. Those things coming together gives that um, strong one year performance. At the same time, the discount narrowed a, a bit. So you know that the, the, when things come together, that's it can make short term performance look strong. But you know we are thinking the longer term and. Um, I actually, though I've reduced the alter, some of the alternative names, they they're going to be very much part of the portfolio going, remain part of the portfolio going forward. So, if you're reducing them based on their valuation, um, even if even if they're part of your long-term um, investment thesis, how do you how do you value companies? What metrics do you use? It's quite an interesting area there's lots of talk about how the old techniques of price to earnings ratios are perhaps um less relevant than than they once were what's your approach to valuing companies well when i look at any company regardless of of, of the industry and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking i start with sales uh, and um what sales could be in the future and then i think what my pound, the pound we we, we buy the company at, the pound that we put in, how much sales is it going to buy in in the future, and um, th- therefore, why do I like that? I think I think the sales are the size of the, it gives you a real feel for the size of the business. Um, profits, as you say, um, can be a, a more ephemeral in that what can happen is you. Can, you different accounting techniques you can margins where are margins going you can worry about that but no start with sales and even at the at the early stage companies i'm thinking what sales could be in five ten years time with with um value stocks at the other end the mature older companies i'm thinking what are sales today what are sales going to be next year um and it, it's, it's that, that that drives all the valuation approach. Think what sales are, and then you stand back. You know what kind of margin are they going to make on those sales? But that's that that comes second. First, think of the size of the business, and think of that uh, um, at the time you're thinking of the market cap of the business. And has that been consistent over your career, or or is that something that's evolved? Yes, and the, the thing is, the sales number is a relatively clean number. Sales to market cap hasn't altered 
um, a great deal if, if, over time it, um, as a valuation technique. The market is in relatively cheap territory for me on that sales to market cap number. Um, and when it gets into high, uh, um, get, gets higher, we might reduce. If it falls, we'll be adding. It, 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 for me, it's the, the, um, the real measure. I, I think it's fair to say you're a bottom-up stock picker. Um, but how, how concerned are you by macro conditions, such as high national debt, low interest rates, the prospect of inflation? Does this feed into your investment process? Yes, yes it, it, it must, it must colour. But um, it's very difficult to um, add value. There are a lot of clever people that are thinking about these issues and how you how we can add value when there are all these these clever people doing it. What we're trying to do is pay attention to things people aren't paying attention to. That's how we can add a little bit of value. And in small cap, when no one is really covering the stock properly and we 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 pay attention to it, we can add value. And in and, and the same in medium and large companies, every so often analysts take big macro views and they don't actually pay attention to what the company is doing, what the company is actually saying. Um, and therefore, it's, a pos it's possible to, add, to add, add value like that. At the same time, you've got to be aware of what's happening. But I think it's very difficult to add value by taking a call, oh, inflation's going up. Well, is it? And, if, and even if you're right, inflation's going up, do you buy the right, actually buy the right stocks as a result of that view? It's, 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 we prefer to be seeing if the company is improving, if the, the management's really addressing the issues at hand. Um, we find that's an easier way to, to add marginal value. Um, I've been lucky in, in, in investment trust in that the boards allow me to take that longer view. So we'll always be moving a bit early on, on a company and adding to the position slowly. Um, but we don't really do it on a big macro view. We do it as we're trying to see the company improve as a business. Um, the the Lord Venture, though it's an income, as you said, it's in the income sector, it it has its business that is going that is generating cash profits, and that allows me to look across um, across market cap companies. And I'm not looking just for yield. I'm looking for companies that may in two or three time two or three years time be paying good dividends. They might be paying no dividend at all today, but they are. We we think they will improve generate cash and pay a dividend in the future. And Marks and Spencers would be a, would be a case in point. This is, we're buying Marks and Spencers not on some big idea that UK retail, UK consumer is going to boom or whatever. No, we're doing it because we think management is slowly addressing problems that have been there for years. Actually, during this co the pandemic, they have moved quite fast to reduce their cost base, the, uh, the reduce the number of stores, and that places them for um, for a marginally improved economy in time. Um, but it's not dependent on that improvement. It's dependent on management action. Yeah. Well, you touched on the income there, which is a, a really important area for, for lots of our listeners, I'm sure. Um, so the majority of the funds that you manage have an income focus. Both Lowland and Lauderbenture increased their dividend last year, despite a, quite a substantial drop in dividends received. It, in the case of Lowland, um, I think half of the dividend paid uh, was out of reserves last year, according to the annual report. Um, to what extent does this inhibit your investment style, having to go after dividends? Um. It, it's, a, it's a very interesting question that because for a long time you see, uh, um, dividends were a good valuation technique, and I think they will be again sometime a good valuation technique. But in, recently they haven't been. Why were they a good one? They were a good one because companies that companies that um, 
pay dividends um, are gener usually companies that are cash generative. So as a fund manager, it points you towards companies that are cash generative that, and they're higher yield because they're a bit out of favour. Um, and that means that when they come back to favour, you, you get capital appreciation. So it points you in the right direction. But, but when there's a big break, something like what happened last year, those the, the cash generative companies get challenged when they their sales fall and the dividend hasn't guided you in the right place. Um, I, I think I think income investing goes through these phases when value the valuation of using dividends doesn't work and then it come it'll come back again some some other time. I think I'm I am fortunate that the the investment trusts Laura and I run have got large dividend reserves, revenue reserves, and this allows us to think about what the earnings, what the dividend payment of the company is going to be in two or three years' time, rather than what the dividends are today. And it's about the growth of income rather than absolute income that, that's important. So. Um, at the moment, I'm not pushing. We're not pushing for high dividend-paying companies. We're we're thinking what dividends going to be further out. That makes sense. Um, and dividend level. Yeah, and Lord Ventures is an interesting one because you have more of a an option to invest overseas. So. Your latest fact sheet says that the portfolio has 82% in the UK, um, but the investment policy says up to 45% can be invested overseas. Is this because you see value in the UK relative relative to elsewhere in the world? Yes, the, the UK market is on a low, lower multiple than than other major markets. It's been it's been out of favour um, since really since June 2016 and the Brexit vote. We had quite a lot of overseas selling of the UK market as a result of that. There's there's uncertainty um, that and capital flows towards the UK um, dried up. Um, that 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 is beginning to to reverse um, and beginning to see overseas buyers come into the UK. The, and for a value guy, the um, a value investor, the um, over corporate activity is is coming in, which is giving uh, some confidence to people. So we are seeing bids for for UK companies, particularly from America at the moment. Um, I think they, they're getting very good deals with some of these people that are coming over and buying UK assets. Um, their, pay, their, their companies are probably more highly valued back in their home markets. Um, and so they are using the coming to the UK and taking an opportunity. But that that, that is helping the overall market in the UK. It, it's reminding people of the value that's there. Yeah. I wondered um, how much overlap is there between the trusts and how do you pick which companies go into which one? Um, well, I like to think each of the um, investment trusts has got its own distinct character. It's um, there. I think for an investment trust to, to to exist, it needs it needs to be adding. Doing something different, something special. I like to think they're all bespoke portfolios. Um, so for Lord Adventure, it's got uh, a, a, the longest list of stocks. It's got, it's got about 130 holdings. It's it's like a, a one-stop shop if you want to buy UK the UK market. So it it, it it's it's very broad. Um, it's got good quality names that are more highly rated as stocks than 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 there would be in the Henderson Opportunities or Lowland portfolio. So companies like Smith and Nephew or Toyota are in are in are in that list, um, and it's got a lower tracking error to the market than the other two portfolios. It's got this very successful business of its own. So we we don't need to be taking higher level of risk for it to be um, a company 
that that is that is unique and can can add value. So if anyone wants just one share in the UK market, one company, it would be we like to think that would eventually could be could be that. Um, whilst the other extreme is is Henderson Opportunities Trust. This is a special sits fund. This should be a, an adder to a portfolio. This is higher risk. This runs much higher active share, much higher tracking error, um, and we're usually more highly geared with it. It's got much, it's got um, 70%, uh, 65% of the portfolio is is, on, is name stocks. Um, and because that's where we're seeing value, we will reduce the aim stocks if 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 the value if we, we weren't finding um, in opportunities and value in the area. But at the moment, it's sixty five percent. So it's it. I wouldn't. It, it's it'd be an addition to people's portfolio. It wouldn't be a cornerstone. It, it is a special sits fund. Um, and there is very, there isn't therefore much. Um, there aren't many stocks that are in both Lord Adventure and Henderson Opportunities Trust. As a result, um, the the Henderson Opportunities are, is much smaller. So we we're buying very. We will we'll buy companies of any size. I bought a company with a market cap of five million the other day. Henderson Opportunities Trust is a recovery situation, a foundry company. Called Chamberlain, um, it would it would be inappropriate to buy that type of company for Lord Debenture. Um, uh, the um, the overlap between Lord Debenture and Lowland is about sixty um, percent at stock level. They are they are closer. Um, the outlier would be Henson Opportunities Trust. Okay, thank you. And you mentioned gearing. The gearing. Does look quite high across the trust. Is that reflective of your sentiment towards the UK? Yes, it's, it's I'm feeling positive about the UK. The the, the, um, the additional gearing that we've added in recent years, in, the, in the recent months, has been money borrowed at less than one percent. We're buying stocks that are yielding three and a half, four percent a year out. So um, it's adding to the 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 earnings and I think it's an indication of of the value that 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 is in the companies we're buying. Um, I think trusts on the whole should be geared. Um, equities outperform the cost of borrowing over time. Um, I think you should run it up when when you see the opportunities and run it back bring it back when um, values values are, are higher. No, but we'll never call the market correctly. It's We're just net buyers of equities at the moment. And when we're not seeing the opportunities, we need to be net sellers. We're not going to make some big market call. It's more just a direction of travel. And the direction at the moment is to be adding, to be looking for opportunities, um, participating in rights issues, for instance, capital raises, um, There'll be some recovery um, situations. There will also be um, some capital raises for companies that are coming out of a difficult period, and we want to participate in those. Yeah. You mentioned that nearly two-thirds of Henderson Opportunities is in AIM. Do you worry about what a change in tax rules might do to the AIM market? That's what we've spoken about, because they have this inheritance tax status break um is that something that concerns you oh it excites me actually <laughs> go on uh, i think you know i think it would fall we would see some some falls in prices and that would be uh, the opportunity it, it is one of the privileges of running closed end money um which an investment trust is you don't get the money out you don't get the money in in the same way as you do with other funds so something like that would lead to a sell-off in certain areas, no doubt about it. I think if there was a really big um, change in inheritance tax rules, and that would be exciting. I'll be in work that day um, <laughs> and, and be looking for looking for things to buy. And that and that that is the privilege of investment trust money that you know you can we we can borrow, we could buy on those like that, knowing that we're not going to get money out, um, that we've got that pot. And we can really st step up 
in, in, investing because a good company yeah. is a good company. It's not it's not it's not tax breaks that make a good company. It's 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 service to the customer. It's quality of product. It's the excellence of the company. That that people are some people are in there because they they've got a tax break is is all well and good, but it's not it's not it's not important in the in the the medium to long term for the for that business. Yeah, yeah. Um, now we've spoken a bit about some individual companies, and that's lots of our listeners are, are interested specifically in stocks, and you're in the market of trying to spot mispriced companies. Um, could you just tell us about one or two of the smaller cap um, firms that you're most excited about right now? Yes. Um, one that's across the portfolios is um, an early stage company, Illica. It's it's batteries, solid state batteries. This it, it is making progress, particularly in very, very small batteries um, that could go into lots of different uses. Um, it, it's also working on its Goliath project, which is batteries for the automotive industry. It's it's early days, but there are some promising signs there. It, it would the prize is huge if you could get get um, that right. Um, I believe it is moving in that direction, um, uh, but, but it's it's a it's a relatively small position. In something like Lord Adventure, it's, it's around half half a percent, just under half a percent. Um, but the upside is considerable if 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 that were to come through. Um, it has been s- strong share price wise over the over the, the last year. Um, at but it's a long term story, and it will be volatility on the way. But that, that's the kind of business that. Is that uh, that is benefiting from this decarbonisation, moving away from fossil fuels? Um, the the battery is going to be really a big part of that story. Um, we are in several companies that will be part of the decarbonisation of the economy. Um, and that area is going to see some big stock winners and also going to be a lot of disappointments too. Um, you need yeah. a portfolio approach towards it, but but one of the companies, you've asked me for one company in that <laughs> area, so I've, I've gone for Illica. Thank you. And at the other end of the spectrum, Shell and BP are not going to, not obvious beneficiaries from decarbonisation of the economy. Um, they both feature as holdings across your income portfolios although it does look like you've trimmed them what's your outlook for these firms um i believe they are part of the story um i think the infrastructure a company like shell has got can make the uh, move for decarbonization possible it will be in the shell filling station that you that you will be recharging your battery in time um they uh, will spend uh, considerable amounts on alternative energy in, uh, uh, going forward. I think something like Shell, the rebasement of the dividend has been an important and is good for the company in the medium term, it's so that they bring up capital to spend on the alternative energy um, area. Um, of, but there'll be a long, but it's a long, it's a, it's a, a long road. And we will need oil for the foreseeable future. The debate is how fast you go, you progress down there. And I think Shell is moving in that direction. I think it's moving at a, a pace that is surprising me that a year or two ago, I wouldn't have thought it would have moved as quickly as it has towards alternative energy. I wouldn't have thought the amounts they were spending in that area were as large as they they are at the moment. So uh, I, I no, I think I think um, dialogue, learning about how they see that move, how they see that from from fossil to alternatives, um, is is important, and it is happening. Yeah, another company that features across the portfolios is GlaxoSmithKline. Um, 
which has got some interesting activity at the moment with activist investor Elliot building up a stake. Um, I read that it's been underperforming in R&D um, and it's gearing up to spin out its consumer health business. How do you feel about the investment case for the company currently? Um, I, I think the R&D uh, goes through cycles. You know, the people within a company, people have periods where they're successful and then there are periods where um, it appears nothing is, too many things fail. And I think... Um, and that changes over time. Yeah. And I think we, we shouldn't be surprised if we hear some successes going forward. Just It's just a question of probabilities of from their R&D department. And that change colours how investors see the company. And I don't think you're paying a lot for, for what is in there. And I think the, you could be, I don't know when, we hear about successes from that pipeline coming through. Meanwhile, it's a big engine um, in the company, good sales, um, of course, um, and there are good good products. Um, so I think the valuation is relatively undemanding for what you're getting there. And you've got this option in there that, that actually people – we begin to see some success emerging from their research and development of business. And I appreciate this is out of your sphere, but I'd be interested to hear your take on it as so many people in the UK are now dabbling in cryptocurrencies. Uh, do you think activity in the crypto space has or will have a knock-on effect for the UK stock market? Is it something that you're following? You know, following it, um, I, I don't think I can add any value in it. Um, so I'm not participating on the things, you know, you should try as an investment manager to play to the few strengths you have. And I think um, I've got no insight. I can understand why, I can understand the, the interest in it. Um, I can see people are worried about conventional currency. And, you know, over time, Different, different forms of currency come along, you know, um, and we may be seeing a change from um, a change at the moment. But that said, I don't know. And I, uh, I, I can't see how I get, would add any value in the area. Um, so I watch it. Um, and I'm, 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 I'm not cynical about it. Um, but I, he, it's too difficult for me. No, it's too difficult for me too. <laughs> I'm afraid we're almost out of time. Um, as I was researching for this interview, I came across a number of articles on your boxing prowess. Um, I wonder if Hurricane Henderson has ever fought Terry Smith. I've seen Terry Smith in a gym. Um, and I, I don't think I'd want to fight him when I saw him in a gym. He was, he was, he was. Um, he was really bat hitting a bag hard. This was before, it was quite a long time ago. It was before the London Olympics, I remember him being in a gym and thinking, yes, and, uh, I admired, I'd admired him for, for his, the way he was training. And now I, was, I, was just, I thought I might, might need to stay well clear of him, I thought. <laughs> Are you still boxing now? Uh, no, I I, I, I I spar occasionally. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> well james thank you so much for your time that's been absolutely fascinating and really appreciate having you on thank you Mary. good to talk thank you thank you